Welcome to the 2022 K-State Garden Hour Summer Series. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If you're a regular, welcome back, and we are happy to have you joining us again. This webinar series began in spring of 2020 as a hope to share extension gardening education during the height of the pandemic. With much success, we have reached over 16,000 garden enthusiasts just like you. This webinar is hosted by Kansas State Research and Extension. My name is Amanda Grolo, and I am the Horticulture Extension Agent with the Frontier District. Everyone involved in the development of the series is a, an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticultural education or related disciplines. But most of all, we each have a love of educating and sharing important gardening topics. Before we get started, we do have a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. The first is please use the Q&A feature for questions related to the presentation. This is where we will look for questions in the Q&A session. You should see a button along the bottom tab that says Q&A. Just click on that and you will be able to enter your question that way. Our second, our moderators today are Kala Edwards and Sharon Ashworth and they will be sharing information through the chat during the presentation. They will also help us facil facilitate the Q&A portion of the webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded and we'll post it to the K-State Garden Hour website. We typically upload additional resources related to each topic as well. If we share the links through the chat, we will also link them to the website website. Our website is also where you will have ac access to previous topics and upcoming topics in the 2022 series. Our moderators will also link those in the chat. Today's topic is landscaping for wildlife. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Chuck Ott, Geary County Extension Agent. Well, thank you, Amanda. It's good to be with everybody today. Just take a minute here so I can get the screen shared. I cannot do two things at once anymore. I never really could, but start the slideshow. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's great to be here. I, I love talking about wildlife, especially birds. And this is a topic that allows me to merge my, my personal passion birds with my professional side, and that's plants and helping homeowners um, get, get more out of their landscape. So I kind of subtitle this, take a walk on the wild side. I call it landscaping for wildlife. It, it's, I'll, there'll be a natural tendency for me to talk about birds, but you know, you can just about make it fit any way you want to. Um, you can call it wildscaping, you can call it birdscaping. And, and basically we're simply trying to create a bird or wildlife friendly yard to bring the birds or the animals closer to you. This is not the same as naturalistic landscaping. In naturalistic landscaping, if you, you know, build your house in an Eastern deciduous forest setting, that's how you landscape it. If you build it up on top of the Flint Hills, it's gonna look like tall grass prairie. What we're talking about is a very manipulated landscape, trying to create little micro zones of micro ecosystems that will attract all sorts of wildlife into your yard. I'm not gonna show you any specific landscape plans I'm not a landscape design and a landscape architect. We've got plenty of people like that around. Um, asking questions and encouraged and expected, put them in the chat. If you put them in the chat, we'll get to them one way or another. Um, I'll say I will be available after my presentation to answer questions. I will answer the questions in the Q&A that the moderators throw to me until they shut me off at, at 12 59 59 but you know i've got my email at the very end and i encourage you if you don't get your question answered send me an email i'll be happy to visit with you about it a couple of things to keep in mind some of the things i'm going to talk, ugh, some of the things i'm going to talk about may violate traditionally accepted landscape principles um, i'm thinking about it from a uh, uh, birds from a from a wild critters point of view secondly some of the ideas may violate your neighbor's sense of good landscaping and their tolerance. It may also kind of push your own family members to the limit. Now, if this is your neighborhood, and I did live in this neighborhood, not that house, but in this neighborhood for 30 years, if that's your neighborhood with a homeowner's association, a backyard like this may just be pushing the limits way too far. That was not my backyard, I wish it was. 
Um, it also helps if there are times to think like a bird, think like whatever it is that you're trying to, to attract. As humans, we have these wonderful brains that allow us to use logic and reason and problem solving. Animals don't think like we do. It's probably a good thing. Um, it, it's fight or flight, man. It, it's, it's either they're going to stand up for themselves or they're going to be gone or they're going to be lunch. So sometimes you just have to go outside, sit quietly and see if you can put yourself in, in that cardinal's perspective, in, in that squirrel's perspective. How, why are they doing what they are doing? Spend some time observing how wildlife behave. Different times of year, different times of day. Where are they? What are they doing? Why? Uh, a lot of it comes down to the need to eat and the need to reproduce. Or to put it bluntly, 90% of the behavior we see in animals comes down to food and sex. Plain and simple. That's what it's all about. Birds, wildlife, all creatures have the same basic needs. They need water. They need food. They need cover. Now, cover can be shelter from weather or predators, safe nesting locations, um, safe roosting locations. And, and let's, let's differentiate between roosting and nesting. Uh, in, in the wintertime, for example, around the large reservoirs, we'll get large roosts of bald eagles. None of them are nesting right there, but they roost there. So that's a, that's a minor difference. Let's not get too hung up in that. Water is the number one thing that all creature, creatures need. Uh, right now, it's summertime in Kansas. Um, parts of the state have been rather dry and hot again. So, so water is needed. Other times of the year, this is clearly not a picture taken today, um, other times of year, it can be cold and there can be no open water. So simply having a heated bird bath may be attractive not only to the bluebirds and the robins, but also to the squirrels or maybe a raccoon or something else that you have in your yard. Now, be prepared because what you think is going to be a, a place where birds can bathe and, and drink may be a little squirrel's respite on a hot summer afternoon. This wasn't this summer. This was last summer. It could have been yesterday for that matter. But this little guy spent about 45 minutes there that day. And I kept seeing him put his foot into the water and then bring it back out. It was really kind of cute. Um, it may be some food that you're putting out in a, in, a, in a feeding trough like this. It may be your choice of plants that you use. Here we've got a little Danny woodpecker working its way up to actually a dead limb higher up in the tree. So food can take many, many different forms. The other thing to remember is you're putting out an, an, a welcome sign to whatever is out there. This happens to be out my front window now that I live out at the farm. Looked out there one evening and here was Rocky Raccoon and Opie the, the Opossum, um, both chowing down on some bird seed that I put out. If these kind of things are going to unsettle you, you probably shouldn't be putting out bird feed at all. Um, but if you're okay with that, just know that there's a lot of creatures out there other than what you may have perspective of. And by the way, I've got game cam pictures of, of deer at, this, at these same feeders. You know, cover and shelter may look like this rather messy backyard. And that was my backyard when I lived in town. Um, it's, there's a lot of things we're going to talk about when it comes to having protection, having shelter, having shade uh, for these animals. I like theorems. A lot of them may not make any sense to anybody else, but I, I like them. And the first one is, if you plant it, they will come. But there's no telling whether they're going to have two legs and wings, four legs, six legs, eight legs, no legs. It's just you're putting out an, an open table, and you have no idea what's going to come there. Um, your landscaping may not help any creature survive the seasons any better. But let's be right honest. While, we're, while ultimately we hope it's going to help them, a lot of times we're just trying to get them in closer to our yard, closer to their house so we can see them better. That might be a goldfinch that I saw yesterday morning on a volunteer sunflower outside my back door. You know, it may be that giant swallowtail that was hitting my zinnias a couple of days ago that I got to, to watch for 20 minutes, makes it so much fun. We want to see them better because we, we find wildlife to be calming, to be soothing, unless it's a squirrel getting on our feeders, but we just, we want to have fun with it. Okay, give me shelter. A little play on the Rolling Stones there. The more diverse the mix of trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, the more diverse and the greater number of species of plants you have, the greater number of species of wildlife that you will have in your yard. Um, the edge effect is what wildlife managers talk about where two ecosystems meet. 
In Kansas, it's often grassland and woodland, those areas where they meet. It could also be grassland or forest area and, and aquatic or marsh. We tend to get a lot of ecosystem specialists at the edge. On smaller properties, we can still do this amazingly. Um, but on a large scale, this happens to be out at Milford Lake here outside of Junction City. The land managers have, have got this area of, of timber back here and cedar trees that draw that heads down to the lake. And then they keep this area somewhat open with grassland. Again, not a picture taken yesterday. Uh, and then right along the edge here, they till it up every year and they'll plant sunflowers or, or milo, grain sorghum in there. Not to harvest, just to provide some shelter, some food primarily for the wildlife that'll be coming there. Some basic principles in smaller urban lots. And I, I lived in a, in a lot in town that was 5,000 square feet. That was a challenge. Put larger trees on the perimeter, smaller trees and shrubs closer to the house, closer to your feeders, closer to the bird bath, to whatever. You wanna create safe travel lanes. In the case of birds especially, they, they don't come flying in at, at three, 400 feet and say, oh, we got feeders down there and they dive down to them. They come in and they land on the tops of the trees, the tallest trees. They're looking around for threats, for risks, for food, for water. And then they start working their way down, step by step by step by step, until they get to the food. This also means that they've got cover and shelter where they can get away in a hurry. So you want to have those safe travel lanes so they're not exposed to predators any longer than they have to be. Here we've got, and this is that 5,000 square foot lot. At the time this picture was taken, here's a lace bark elm, had a cottonwood over here, uh, had a couple of espalier fruit trees next to the, um, to, the, to the deck and an arborvita here and some boxwood. Here was last year's cedar tree, uh, Christmas tree, happens to be a Fraser fir. You know, I've got all these different areas where they can come into. They can fly up to get shelter. They can fly in to get shelter. I've got a bird feeder here just out of sight to the right is, is the bird bath. So there's a lot of opportunities there for them. The threats that I mentioned just a minute ago, these can be ground-based, cats and snakes are the two big ones, or they can be airly based, birds of prey, hawks, falcons, occipiters, provide protection and escape from both. For ground-based threats, birds give alarm calls that cross species lines, and they seem to be specific for whether it's an aerial or ground-based threat. If it's ground-based, if it's a cat, if it's a snake, everything just sort of jumps up in the air. If it's an aerial based threat, a hawk coming in, they dive into cover. They want to try to put as many layers of twigs, leaves, whatever, between them and that hawk as possible. Um, just generally, evergreens make great windbreaks on the north in the winter and on the west and southwest in the summer. Um, evergreens also make good cover close to feeders. If I can go back up, here you can see I've got the arborvitae, I've got the boxwood here. Um, e even the, the old Christmas tree, which I still do, by the way. Um, those are all providing evergreen cover that they can get into for windbreak and for protection from hawks. Management practices. As gardeners, we quite often tend to be um, a little bit obsessive sometimes, especially in the fall. We tend to be that busy bee that even in the late winter, it's like, oh, it's nice. I've got to be outside doing something now. I can do this. I can do that. Just relax and chill out. Uh, leave a lot of that stuff there because a lot of that cover that we leave is protection for somebody else. I've even gotten to the point that I don't start cleaning up my flower beds and all that until it's April. And then I make a pile of it over the corner of the, of the farmstead so that birds can go and start stripping fibers apart for, for nests so that the insects that may have been overwintering in some of those stems have a chance to complete and, and come out. So leaving those old annuals, those old perennials for cover and feed can make a big difference. Again, my backyard when I lived in town, all of these sunflowers were volunteer from the sunflower cedars that I would have along here. Drove the neighbors crazy. But the, by the time you get to February and March, there were always little woodpeckers working away on these stems, looking for little boars inside there. You know, the, the goldfinches, the pine siskins would have cleaned out every single one of the seeds up here. Even the squirrels I would catch climbing up here, trying to see if there were any seeds left. So, you know, leave it, it'll get cleaned up eventually. I mentioned this earlier, any place you see bird, you can replace bird with about any species and apply the same concepts. Now, we're gonna talk about some wildlife friendly plants here. K-State Research and Extension and the Kansas Forest Service have several bulletins about um, landscaping plants, uh, you know, preferred landscaping plants for 
different parts of Kansas for wildlife. Um, I think they may be putting some of those up, but it's, it's just, it's a good source there. But I'm gonna go through a list of my favorite plants. Most of them are native. First of all, for, for trees and shrubs, both smaller and larger. And then I'm gonna wind up with some stuff on hummingbirds because everybody loves hummingbirds nowadays, it seems like. Um, when you're thinking about bird-friendly plants, wildlife-friendly plants, think food first. Smaller seeded has broader appeal. Think cover. Think nesting and reproduction. I'll talk about several preferences there. Um, squirrels love things like um, oak trees because they can go up this time of year and clip the, the ends of the branches off and then gather those all up and make, make their, their nests up in the tree getting ready for winter already. So think about all those things. Emphasize native adapted plants. Now, the, we've got a lot of non-native plants that aren't a problem, but non-native alien invaders are becoming a real problem bush honeysuckle, ornamental pears. I've got a slide all about them later. Remember that we live in a prairie state. It gets hot in Kansas. It can be dry in Kansas, shock. It can be windy in Kansas. Keep all those things in, in mind, you know, right plant, right place. Um, and many of those species, like the two I mentioned, are naturally aggressive when placed in a new environment. We remove them from their native environment, the natural controls aren't there and they just explode. We've seen it time and time again. My number one favorite plant is probably every pasture manager's least favorite plant, and that's the Eastern Red Cedar. And part of that is that some of the characteristics that make it a good wildlife plant also make it despised by pasture managers. Here we've got foliage. We've got a female Eastern Red Cedar, Juniperus virginiana. Some people are going to look at that, a, a, a rancher is going to look at that and say, OMG, look at all the little cedar seedlings I'm going to have to be dealing with. Uh, a bird watcher like myself is going to look at that and go, wow, look at all that food for birds. Another person may look at it and say, wow, look, we've got, got flavoring for gin here. So, you know, same plant, many different uses. Hackberry. Oh, this, I've got a love-hate relationship with hackberries. They are invasive in urban settings they produce a lot of seed. They can be somewhat short-lived. They seem to be go doing good for 40 to 50 years and then they start to fall apart. Kind of reminds me of myself at times, but leaves attract small insects. Um, get the little nodules on there, the, the, the hackberry psyllid. And those little things are gonna be hatching, are gonna be emerging from those bumps now and swarming the sides of the house this fall. Very, oh, just people hate them. The seeds are small and they're very popular with birds. If you plant them, plant it away from the house. Plant it in a windbreak, plant it in the corner, someplace where it's not a risk to the house. Because they will, especially after about 40 or 50 years, they'll start to go to pieces. If they are pruned poorly, they will start to go to pieces. Keep it away and the birds will love you for it. Now, flowering crab apple. We need to be getting rid of all of those ornamental pears and just go back to flowering crabs. Um, choose one and then this KSRE bulletin on flowering crab apples is amazing. You can choose the color of blossom. You can choose what kind of fruit it has on it and how long it retains the fruit. Um, leaf disease resistance. Get one that's cedar apple rust and apple scab resistant. Um, choose one that bears a lot of fruit, retains it well. Don't plant it where it's going to overhang, say a driveway or a sidewalk, because when that fruit starts to fall off, it can be a risk. It can be a slip risk. It can be a, just a lot of hazards there. We see very few problems with flowering crab apples volunteering. Ornamental pears, oh my gosh, they're creating forests everywhere. The, the flower, the, the little seeds from the flowering crab apples just don't seem to be a problem. Flowering crab apple, we need to get back to those, they're wonderful. Eastern redbud, a native. Choose location carefully. Remember, out in the wild, this is an understory tree. It's right on the edge, it gets shade. And we have this bad habit, I'm guilty of it too, of planting them where? right where they're gonna get full sun, full Southwest wind, because we wanna you know, use it as an accent on the corner of the house. Um, it's a small tree, it's a short lived tree. Don't expect this to be here for a hundred years. 30 year old, 40 year old redbud may be doing pretty good. Good for close to the house, good cover plant, attracts late season insects. Now, this is one of my favorite hummingbird plants, not because of the blossoms, the blossoms are gone by the time the hummingbirds get here in, in late April. But if you go out and look at the plant now, from now until through September, look at the undersides of the leaves. 
covered with lots of little insects that the hummingbirds need. It's their protein source. It's also got a lot of little branches that the hummingbirds love to land on. And then that becomes their perch to attack anybody else that comes near their feeders. So good plant, use it appropriately. Roughleaf dogwood is a native shrub. It's another pasture manager's headache, but it's natural, it's native, late summer food source for migrants. I'm gonna be leading a bird walk at Milford Lake this weekend. And there's a couple of places I wanna go that have a lot of just long rows of rough leaved dogwoods. And they're gonna be just filled right now with these little white berries that are ripening up. And by the 1st of October, every single one of these berries will have been eaten by birds. Birds just flock into it. It's great. Now, it, it spreads by underground, by, by rhizomes. So it's got root shoots that come up. It likes to run. Plant it where there's room for it to expand. Don't plant it alongside your house. Um, put it out away from the house. Put it in, in, a, in a landscape setting. Put it in a, in a shelter belt kind of thing. In the corner of a lot in town. But um, wildlife love it. Preferred nesting plant for Bell's Vireo, a little bird that chatters away all the time, but a good plant. Virginia creeper, a native vine. Um, it'll run up just about anything. It, it just loves to climb, has this great red fall co color. Um, the, the plant itself has berries on it. Um, I've seen wild turkeys taking the berries off this thing. So great plant. Don't confuse it with poison ivy. Remember, it's got five leaflets. Poison ivy has three leaflets. Things we should be planting more of, service berry and June berry. Red twig dogwood, that's a good accent plant next to the house. The, the red color is great in the wintertime. American holly, probably the eastern half of the state will do pretty good. You get down in southeast Kansas, it may start to um, volunteer an awful lot. My friends uh, in southeastern U.S., friends in North Carolina hate this because it just shows up everywhere like like elms and, and hackberries do for us. Winterberry, buffalo berry. Now, do not go to a nursery and say you want a poison ivy plant. They will throw you out of there. But poison ivy is native. It's a survivor. It also has white berries. And the wildlife love it. If you've got a larger lot, if you've got a rural setting, and you've got some poison ivy in a back corner where nobody's going to come in contact with it, leave it alone. It's a survivor. It can grow right down a, an, an eroding slope and help stabilize it. Um, but if it's where people, sensitive people are around, I could do a whole other hour on poison ivy, but just let it go. It's not a bad wildlife plant. Okay, bigger trees in, in, in larger settings. Bur oak. Slow to moderate growth rate. They actually can grow faster than people realize. It's a good mast crop tree, meaning acorns. Now, this is a big acorn. Quercus macrocarpa. That macrocarpa means large cap. It's, it's that if you look at a baroque acorn, you understand that. It's native, it's strong, it'll be here for 200 years if you don't abuse it. Um, it it's a good tree, but it's going to take time, patience, and a lot of room. Red oak is another one. It's got a smaller acorn, so it's going to be more usable by a lot of different species. It's faster growing than baroque. I've got a red oak out at the farm that's been putting on two, two and a half feet of upwards growth every year. It's turning into a beautiful tree, has some nice fall color to it. It is native to Eastern Kansas. It tends to be more pyramidal than a bur oak is, is a lot like those old American elms that we used to love. It's more pyramidal, still a very strong tree. It's not quite as strong as a, as a bur oak, but it's a very good choice. I love red oak. There's several different versions of it. Um, and, and actually, there's a lot of different oaks that we should be planting more of in Kansas. I prefer burrs over maples. You'll not see a maple in this presentation. Sycamore, London Plain, American Plain, London Plain. People may laugh at this one, but it's a big tree. It can be a messy tree because of the exfoliating bark. Wood is not that strong. It needs deep soils. It needs moist locations. Keep it away from the house. The small insects love the leaves. Go out this time of year in August and start turning over the leaves on a sycamore tree. They are loaded with lace bugs, plant bugs. Just, you know, have a friend walk under it and knock the leaves. They'll be covered with them. Yeah, they won't be your friend any longer. The, these things are great for hummingbirds, small fly catchers, a lot of smaller birds that are starting to migrate through Kansas in August and September. Great, great food source. Keep it away from the house, though. 
Cottonwood, our state tree, grows big, fast, weak wood. Does it attract lightning in the fact that it's a very moist wood and tends to be the tallest tree around? Yeah, it attracts lightning. Um, but along with the sycamore, it is the preferred nest tree for Baltimore Orioles. Needs deep soil, needs lots of space. Again, if you've got you know, a small creek on your property, if you've got some place that's going to have a good source of water, plant a sycamore, plant a cottonwood. Wildlife use them a lot. Now we get into the hummingbird plants. It's a very exciting time of year because hummingbirds are now into their southbound migration phase. In, in the end of April and early May, they are, you know, they're heading north to the breeding grounds. About 5% of the ones that pass through Kansas stay in and, and nest. The rest go on further north. It's, it's fall now or it's late summer. They're heading south. They've got all the time in the world. The next six to eight weeks is hummingbird central. This is the time to get those feeders out. And if you're making landscape plans, and we're, we're going to be planting trees and shrubs this fall, we're making plans for, for next year. Um, this is the time to, to get plants that are blooming. Number one favorite hummingbird plant lady are the salvias. It could be lady and red salvia like this one. There's several new cultivars that, um, that have the same growth habit. We've got pots of them at my house right now. Um, the traditional red salvia. Got friends out in Garden City that puts, oh, they've got 20 or 30 pots of salvias every year. And when that first early frost comes in, the cars are outside and all the pots of salvia go into the garage. And once that thread has passed a frost, they bring them back outside and they've got three to four more weeks of, of bloom. So a plant that you can do a lot of things with. Agosta shea, agastaki, I can't, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, this is another one that 15 years ago, this plant was hard to find. I had to order it out of specialty nurseries in the, in the Western US. Now they're much more available a lot of uses. I've seen big plantings of this just covered with Rufus hummingbirds in, in Colorado. So good plant, not only hummingbirds, but pollinators love these things too. Now on the left, you're gonna see the world's largest humming, hummingbird feeder. Um, that is an old windmill tower out at my farm and it is covered with trumpet vine. Now, when we lived in town, this 5,000 square foot lot, I bought a trumpet vine, trumpet creeper plant and planted it in the backyard. This was in the spring of 1987. In the spring of 1988, I started trying to kill that one trumpet vine. And when I sold the property in May of 2021, I was still trying to kill that trumpet vine. Um, they are aggressive, they grow, they cover, and they will attract hummingbirds like you would not believe. Um, I took one of those root sprouts from town and moved it out here when my, my in-laws lived at the farm then. And there used to be just completely covered with, with um, Virginia creeper here. And the trumpet vine is now winning out. I still have to keep it trimmed up down here so I can mow around it. But this thing is just covered with hummingbirds. Um, they're flying around it now, chasing each other. It will attract hummingbirds. Um, Orioles will, will use it also, though. Oriole, by the time this one is coming into full bloom, the Orioles are pretty well moving out. But just realize it needs a lot of space. It amazingly is native to the US. Um, it's, it's an amazing plant, but be cautious with it. Scarlet runner bean, an heirloom bean variety. It, it allows you to, to garden up, to put up a trellis. It's a dry bean. Uh, you can pick the flowers off after they get through blooming, or you can harvest the pods for the dry beans. But if you buy a package of, of hummingbird seed mix in the spring, uh, there's probably going to be some scarlet runner beans in it. Hummingbirds love that. The red really attracts them. Hummingbirds will feed on other flowers other than just the red flowers. Red is the flashing neon light that brings them in. Uh, it has to do with quantity and quality of nectar. That's what they're going to feed on. So cardinal climber is, is not native. Um, my friends in southeastern Kansas say they sometimes have troubles with it volunteering from seed. I, I hate to make this comparison, but it's kind of like bindweed with a red flower, only it's an annual. It dies with a first, I mean, showed a picture of a 32 degree thermometer and it's probably going to die. That's how sensitive it is. Um, you can have it go up some, uh, up a trellis, up a pole, anywhere, but it attracts a lot of hummingbirds. 
Cardinal flower is, is a plant that we don't use enough of. It tends to like wetter areas. It is native. Um, if you've got a wet spot, a shady spot, someplace like that, cardinal flower is a wonderful choice. Hummingbirds love it. Pollinators love it. Uh, and, it's, and it's readily available in the trade. Now, bee balm, I don't have any bee balm at my house. And, and I get mixed reviews when I talk to people about it. It's a great pollinator plant. But this is just kind of a marker that I like to keep in here just to warn people that any of these hummingbird plants that you put out there that bloom, if they're going to attract hummingbirds, if they're going to attract, attract butterflies, they're going to attract bees. If you are allergic to bee stings, be very careful with how you landscape with these. Um, I've got a dear friend that is, she doesn't travel with one EpiPen anymore. She travels with two EpiPens and bees are one of them. And she just keeps putting flowers out. And I go, Linda, don't do that, you know, use them. But it's, it's something that just be aware that there is a risk if you are allergic to bee stings. Butterfly bush. My butterfly bush is across the driveway from all my other hummingbird plants. I see hummingbirds at it. They fly down out of the mulberry tree and they, they feed on it. Um, I like to have it just because it is such a butterfly magnet. It really is. And, and this, this is my, my butterfly bush. Um, there, there are many different colors of them out there. I've just always had really good luck with the purple ones. There are red ones. I don't know that they would attract hummingbirds anymore, but it's one that I, I just really enjoy it. Um, Prune it down heavily because it's going to bloom on the new growth every year. So prune it down heavily or it'll get a lot of dead in it. Just whack it down six inches tall is what I do with mine every year. Hollyhock. Every old farmstead used to have just hollyhocks everywhere. They grew up and they just were there. Uh, wet weather, dry weather, they were always there. And then for some reason, they fell out of flavor. Flavor? Fell out of favor. And I don't know if that was because we started using more herbicides or just what, um, or because we started tearing down all the old outbuildings, the farmsteads, but they're, they're coming back to becoming more popular. Uh, I planted several hollyhocks out of the farm this year. I'm going to be planting more. It's just a fairly low maintenance plant that you can put out there. And once you get them established, they're going to take care of themselves. Very attractive to hummingbirds and other pollinators. Rose of Sharon is another one that really has, um, that same kind of hollyhock flower to it. It's also one that grow that's going to bloom on new growth. So it's one that if you're that obsessive gardener that needs to get out in the spring and do something, or you have a spouse that is, um, plant some rose of Sharon because then you can put it out there and say, oh, go prune the rose of Sharon. It's March. Go ahead and prune it because you're not. It's not like lilac. You're not cutting off the blossoms at that point in time. It also makes a good screening. You can put these things fairly close together along a fence line. They tend to grow very much up. Um, and if you've got that neighbor you really don't want to deal with, makes a great screen. Grows up, they can't see what you're doing. Uh, I, I somewhat jest about that, but it does make a good screen from traffic, from a neighbor just for whatever reason, and the hummingbirds like it. Cannas are one that, I, it took me forever to remember to put this slide in here. Um, they don't have to be red. They can be any color at all. I was down in, in Georgia, one of those big fancy gardens one, one fall, early September. They had a huge, probably 50 feet across landscape mound, and it was covered with all different kinds of cannas. Sidewalk around that, and then these trees all the way around that. And trying to walk around that whole landscape mound was dangerous because of all the hummingbirds coming and going from the trees to the cannas. Uh, very good. I mean, we normally we're going to have to dig them up in the fall to get them going, but don't underestimate the power of cannas to attract hummingbirds. They will attract a lot of hummingbirds. And really, we've got a lot of choices out there. Okay, let's talk for a minute about plants we need to get out of our landscapes. Um, and I say that because these are two plants that are he heavily spread by wildlife, especially birds. The ornamental pears. I don't know if you care if you just call it generic calorie or Bradford, any of the cultivars. Um, they used to be fruitless because they were all Bradfords. Then as we brought in all these other different cultivars, they were just genetically enough different, they could now start to cross pollinate. The birds eat them and they pass that seed through and wherever they park themselves, when that happens, you're gonna get a pear tree growing there. Um, I, I've seen fence rows in urban areas that are just now a tangle of, of wild pears. And when these things volunteer, the next generation 
they tend to get these spike-like thorns on them. And it's just, you go through that picture on the lower left, you try to walk through that. And I mean, I, I bleed so easily on my arms, I'll probably be a bloody mess coming out of there. But we, we don't just need to be not planting them any longer. We need to be removing them from the landscape. We have two in front of, we had two in front of our office that were planted here in 1988. I had the county take them down this year. I said, no, they're, they're a problem. And if I'm saying we need to take them down, we need to take those down. So get those out of there. Bush honeysuckle. Um, the, the problem with this thing, first of all, is that berry right there. Birds see into the ultraviolet so well, and that berry is just flashing red, and they eat it like crazy. And again, they spread it all over the place. And then it starts to volunteer, especially in, in woodland areas, and becomes just a thick monoculture. And the native oaks, the, the pecans, the hickories, the walnuts can't make it up through that. So all of a sudden, we, we don't have the natural succession of plants going on. This is another one. It, it's, I mean, we used to, the Kansas Forest Service used to sell it as a wildlife plant. And then we said, um, we've got a problem here. So we don't do that anymore. Again, if you've got them in your yard, you need to be starting to remove them. And we just need to be more aggressive about getting them out of everywhere. But these are plants that, and, and this one, I, I want to do some more research on, on the bush honeysuckle because there, I've seen bits and pieces that there's some speculation that these berries may not have as much nutrition. The nutritional value may be lower than some of our native plants. I've just got to try to find more information on that. But just that red berry is just asking for problems. Get them out of the landscape. Get them out of the, the woodlands. Let's just get to work on this. We've got to quit digging the hole any deeper because we're in a big hole already. Other considerations, and there's a lot of options here. Um, appropriate use of shelters and houses for birds. Lots of different birds. I mean, if you want some plans or know what can I do, um, give me a call. A lot of people put up purple martin houses where they shouldn't be, um, but a lot of uh, wren houses, bluebird houses, um, a lot of different options there. Sometimes it's simply having some rocks or some rotting wood around underneath a, a, in a landscape area or even underneath a shrub. Those provide all sorts of shelter for toads and frogs and reptiles of all kinds. Um, if you don't like them, simple, just don't pick up the rocks and go looking for them. But these are things that can really be very, very beneficial. Water features. Mo the sound of moving water, whether it's a mister, a dripper, even a small, you know, just, just a, a, a fountain or something in your, in your yard can just attract a lot of wildlife, not just birds, but a lot of wildlife. There's something about, you know, the sound of running water is soothing to humans. It just, it's an attractant to everything, to all the other critters too. Uh, nesting materials, hair, natural fibers. I mentioned using the, 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 the stems like the zinnias, the sunflowers. A lot of birds will go in, in in April and May when they return and start pulling fibers out of there to, to use in their nests. So make sure that if you're putting fibers in there, that they're natural fibers. They're not polyester. They're not rayon, things like that. And you can even, you can take an old, old soot cake box and start putting them in there. Um, the lady that cuts my hair, yes, I do get my hair cut periodically. You can't tell it here, but um, she collects up her hair in the spring and puts it in, in coarse cheesecloth out on the clothesline. She lives out in the country and the birds just come to it and use it like crazy. So provide those nesting materials. You can even buy things to fill up nesting material sources. So it's kind of interesting, actually. I've gone through this really quick today, so we leave a lot of time for, um, for questions. But remember, it's all about having fun. We do this. In part, we want to help a lot of the, an the animals, the insects, the butterflies, the pollinators. But it's also about getting them in closer to where we have fun. You know, I, I had a call today from somebody that was trying to grow some dill to make dill pickles. And it was just loaded with black swallowtail caterpillars. They said, what do we spray them with? I said, nothing. Just they're, they're about ready to cycle out. The dill will put on some new growth. We don't have to kill it just because it's feeding there. Plant more next year. And that way you'll probably have more caterpillars. But, you know, just so you have enough to, to make your dill pickles with. But re understand the big picture. Have fun doing it. That's really what, what I encourage people to do in any of these things. Um, uh, that's how you can get a hold of me, um, ciotti at ksu.edu. Htt ksbirds.org is a is a 
is the home website for the Kansas Ornithological Society. This last one here that's ridiculously long, but I've got about eight backyard birding guides there, including stuff on landscaping for, for wildlife and like that. I will put a disclaimer here that phone number will get, be good until April 2nd, at which point, I mean, April 2nd, I'm sorry, September 2nd. Well, the phone number will be good after that, but I will be retiring September 2nd, but this email address will continue to be good and valid and will be an excellent way to get in touch with me if you have questions. I'll leave that open now. I will turn it back to the moderators and hopefully we got a lot of questions coming in and let's let's just go and have fun. Great. Thank you, Jeff. I do have, this is Sharon Ashworth from Douglas County. Um, I do have a number of questions and they're coming in fast and furious here at the end. Um, but to start off with at the beginning, we had um, a few questions. Um, we have a lot of questions about wildlife damage. So I'm going to right away re remind people that we do have a um, uh, Dr. Drew Wicketts will be speaking on November 2nd, specifically about wildlife damage and control. So please tune in for that. So we had a lot of questions uh, about that. And so that brings me to a question about that balance between attracting wildlife that you want, but also uh, that worry about attracting maybe too many or other kinds of wildlife that you don't want. So keeping that balance of wildlife at bay and wildlife you want. And good luck with that. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things that you, you just have to realize that when you are doing that, if you make it attractive for cardinals, you're going to get blue jays. If you make it attractive for squirrels, you're going to get probably raccoons and opossums, especially if you live in in anywhere where there's population around. Um, there are things that we can do. You know, we can bring in feeders at night so the raccoons don't tear them up. It's a nuisance. I have to do it certain times of the year. Um, you just, you've got to know what is your tolerance? What can you handle? Um, and if it gets too much, then you've just got to back off on it a little bit. I'm one that, you know, those opossums, they come wandering around. Raccoons and I kind of have a love-hate relationship. Um, I, I had to pull two big old black rat snakes out of a bluebird house last year. Just made me furious. But I know those black rat snakes also keep a lot of rodents under control. So th there's no easy solution across the board. Sometimes if there's a specific issue, we may have ways to, to deal with that. But it's just it, you're thrown out a buffet line and you're opening it up and whoever comes in comes in. Great. Thank you. And then another sort of general question in terms of the water sources, um, how best to keep those clean and how clean do those water sources need to be? In the, I mean, if it's so green, the squirrel can skate across the top of it. It's probably time to be clean. But um, on my bird baths, um, I clean them out about once a week this time of year, um, just from a health point of view and just to keep the algae down. Those, those bird bath bowls are usually some kind of concrete or pottery get a good stiff brush, clean it out. Uh, about once a month this time of year, I clean it at right before sunset. I go out, I put some, some liquid bleach in it. Um, the, the liquid, now you want to get unfragranced un and you just want good old Clorox or, or Purex or whatever with none of that stuff in it because the chlorine in it will evaporate out overnight. In hot weather like this, when I only got down to 80 last night, it'll probably be evaporated out in an hour. But you will kill all those algae spores that are in down in there, and that'll keep it from getting green as you go through. We get into the winter months, and I keep a bird bath heater in one of my bird baths about once oh, every four to six weeks. I got to get out there and, and brush it out and clean it out because even when it's cold, the water's only going to be at 50 degrees, it'll still start to, to grow some algae in there. So clean them out about, I'd say, once a week this time of, of year. Okay, um, thank you. I have a couple of specific questions about food sources. Like, is amaranth considered a good food source? And also, in that same question, ornamental millet, would that be a good? Okay. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if the amaranth is going to have thousands of tiny little black seeds, and I have watched a lot of species of birds in the fall out in the wild getting up there and getting those out of there. Um, so yeah, the, the domestic amaranth with those big cascading seed heads, absolutely, it's going to be a good source. Millet, totally. 
I, there's several different types of millet. There's foxtail millet. There's uh, um, pearl millet. Prozo millet is the one that is in the bird seed mixes, a little hard white seed. Um, I get volunteer millet around my bird feeders every year, and I just let it grow. I just let it grow. But yeah, they're going to be fine. I even get volunteer milo sometimes. Milo is not as heavily used by birds, especially if there's other sources available. Get those volunteer plants, let them grow. Volunteer sunflowers are just, they get a pass in my, in my flower beds. You know, they just get to grow regardless. Um, because, th 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 I mean, the, the blossoms are still falling off of the one that I mentioned earlier, right outside the back door. And here was a goldfinch on it yesterday morning, already starting to pull those seeds out of there. So they're going to strip the seeds out by November or December, which is why a lot of times we don't get a lot of activity at our feeders until we get into December and January timeframe, because there's so many natural foods out there and they will usually go to the natural foods first. But yeah, all those things you mentioned, I'd let them grow. Not a problem. Okay. Um, there were, I may have missed this as I was um, trying to answer questions on the Q&A, but um, echinacea is definitely a good food source, but could you talk a little bit about those plants that have maybe a dual role where they have some nectar um, food sources, but they're also handy in the fall for seed eaters? Right. Um, echinacea is one, any of those cone flowers, any of those that have that kind of a flower head are really going to be utilized. Um, I'm Galardia, blanket flower, a lot of those are going to be used. Um, things like chrysanthemums, mums. Um, I've seen goldfinches and sparrows up on those trying to get seeds out of them, but more importantly, they tend, the way we plant them in beds, they tend to create a lot of cover and shelter down there. So those work well. Um, and I'm just, of course, drawing a total and complete blank. Marigolds, zinnias, um, popular plants that, that tend to have a lot of seed that that birds will use. And I hate to say it, but even sometimes the little native mice will get up into those too. And that's okay. That's why you keep the snakes around. Um, but, um, but yeah, any of those are going to be great, great plants to use. I've got red cone flower blooming like crazy right now. Love that thing. Um, I, I don't think my ornamental peppers are going to do anybody much good, but that, that's okay. They look good right now too. Well, here's a, speaking of feeding birds, here's a common question that we see. Is it necessary to feed birds in the summer? Is it necessary to feed birds in the summer? It's necessary to feed birds in the summer. And uh, this writer says that uh, uh, this person is conflicted about it, um, <laughs> about feeding birds in the summer, and they might become too dependent upon the seed source. Okay, let's take that last part first. No, they won't. Um, they will not become dependent. Um, birds' diets change during the year, especially the birds that are here in the summertime. Um, I feed year round. I'll just put that out there right now. Um, most of what we are feeding are, are high carbohydrate foods, seeds, maybe high protein. Um, but we get into May, June, and especially early July, it's breeding season, it's nesting season. A lot of those species are feeding insects because they have such a high protein content. So they're going to feed what they need to to, the, to their young. Um, people say, well, all the Orioles left my Oriole feeders. Well, that's because they're busy finding caterpillars to feed the babies. Um, so you're not doing any damage feeding year round. Um, people complain because the grackles find their feeders by, by the end of July. Yep, that's right. Um, so, but no, you're not doing any damage by feeding year round. If you don't want to feed year round, you don't have to. That's not a problem. We're, we're going to be seeing a shift right now because a lot of species are going to be wrapping up or have wrapped up nesting. Some are leaving September, October, new species will be coming in from the north. But there's going to be a lot of natural food sources out there in the weeds and the crops and all that. So you remembered all the goldfinches that were at your feeder in April and May. And then you are concerned because it's November and December and you don't see them yet. Well, they'll be showing up just as soon as we have a heavy snowfall or the natural food sources start to thin out. So I feed year round. You're not going to be a problem. That was a long answer to a very short question. But. <laughs> That's okay. um, uh, there is a question about should you remove the twig nests of wrens um, in the, from the boxes each year? You know, I generally try to keep mine cleaned out, um, if for no other reason, to reduce the, the risk of parasites and then just kind of a little bit OCD personally about that. But um, in, in the wild pre-human settlement, wrens nested in old, old uh, woodpecker cavities. So they just keep filling that nest up. 
Um, they'll do some cleaning out, but I do just as a matter. It makes me feel better. It's actually not that important whether you do or not. Okay. Um, and uh, a little different take on the chipmunk and squirrel question. Uh, so could, is it possible, is there something that they really like that you could use to lure them away from the things that you're trying to protect? For, for squirrels, they love corn. They absolutely love corn. We don't have chipmunks in, in Geary County, Kansas. So I wish we did because I think they're adorable. My friends in Johnson County laugh at me. Um, but, uh, you know, something like that, acorns, something like that. Um, oh, thank you for whoever stops doing that share screen share. Um, uh, so busy answering questions. I didn't think to do that. The One of the things we can do with rodents, especially um, that are getting into our bird feed, maybe, is we use cayenne pepper, red pepper, ground cayenne pepper, and we just lace that bird seed down heavily. Birds have different taste receptors in their mouth. They do not feel the heat from the capsation. Squirrels, chipmunks, mat, raccoons, you can light them up. You can light them up. So we can do that. But yeah, I'd say put out, put out acorns. Get, go someplace where there's a lot of acorns, gather those up, get corn, and just put that away from, I always say corn is the perfect peace offering to squirrels. Give them corn and then a lot of times they'll leave your sunflower seeds alone. So those are things that I use. All right, and um, I'm trying to, there's a lot of questions um, in the Q&A about um, getting rid of plants and doing so. So I'm trying to focus a little bit on the wildlife <laughs> here. Um, so uh, a question here about managing water again on bird baths. Uh, do they need to be changed? We're worrying about mosquitoes. Okay, that's a very good point. Um, this time of year, conditions like this, mosquitoes are going to have a seven-day cycle time or generation time. That's why I'm out there once a week cleaning them out. And it's, and it's probably actually a little bit more often than that. But, you know, if you change it once a week, you're going to be okay. Goes 10 days, you're probably getting a mosquito population. If it's if it's a pond, a, 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 a little, yeah, a pond is what I'm trying to think of, um, where it's going to be impossible to do that get the mosquito dunks. They have a form of bacillus thuringiensis, variety is real. I don't know which one it is, but it's it's wildlife friendly. It is very specific on mosquito larva. So that's a good option there. But just the stuff, the bird baths like that, once a week, you're covered. Okay. Um, a couple of questions about milkweeds. Um, one, uh, what variety of milkweed is most attractive to wildlife? And then a question about milkweed um, versus the non-native butterfly bush. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, the varieties, I mean, I like swamp milkweed. I like butterfly milkweed. Um, I like good old common milkweed, even though I had to fight that stuff in the farm growing up. Um, those are all excellent sources. Probably swamp milkweed gets hammered by every insect under the sun, which is probably why we like the planet. Um, common milkweed is a little bit better survivor, but I think those three, but there's a lot of different ones out there. If you look at how many native milkweeds there are, those are also going to be the ones I think the easiest to find, but those are my three personal favorites. Um, as far as I'm not sure the total, the, the angle on the question about butterfly uh, milkweed versus butter or milkweed versus butterfly plant. Um, you know, it's, I, I really think that the milkweed is going to have a better nectar source in the long run. I think it's going to be longer, but I think per area, a butterfly bush is going to have a lot more flowers there. So that'd be an interesting thing to study, how much nectar is produced on that. But it, it's, they're, they're kind of like filling two roles. Uh, the butterfly bush isn't going to really serve much of, of larval plants, I don't believe. Pam Paulson can correct me on that, but I don't think it has any, any larval food source. Uh, milkweeds are just going to have so much other options as far as larval food as well as nectaring. Yes. Um, a question here about uh, back to birds, um, trying to attract birds. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe the design of birdhouses? What might be a little better? This person is especially interested in keeping birds safe from snakes. So are there okay. certain birdhouse designs that you would recommend? No, um, to keep snakes out, it's basically you've got to put a physical barrier there, um, put it on a pole and then have some flashing, have a you know, metal tube on it, something so that they cannot get up to it. Um, that's about the only thing you can do. 
that's the only thing you can do. Birds do have preferences on, on bird houses as far as size of the inside cavity, uh, the size of the entrance hole. Um, bluebird houses, there are several designs that are much more effective at keeping starlings and house sparrows out. So I would say send me an email at cotte, C-O-T-T-E at ksu.edu, and I can get you some information on, on the correct size for that and the correct entrance hole. But for snakes out of houses, you got to use some kind of barrier to prevent that from happening. Um, and here's an interesting question about, do bat boxes deter birds in any way from coming into the yard and feeding nests? I have never seen any information on that. The, so I don't think so. And then just as I stop and think about it, their periods of activity are, are different. I mean, bats are starting to get active as most birds are going to sleep. Um, I think about chimney swifts that I've seen flying with bats at the same time in, in that twilight zone. Um, no negative interactions there. I don't see a problem with it. Okay, it looks like we just have time for a couple more. So a real quick one. So, well, there was an article to write, are cardinals redder in winter? There's <laughs> are cardinals what? Redder in winter. Um, I think that was an article that was being referred to. So on um, bush honeysuckle, something about I'm... bush honeysuckle and cardinals. Um, I don't know. And, uh, I mean, cardinals uh, will, cardinals love bush honeysuckle. They'll, they'll eat in probably number one uh, transporter okay. of the seeds around. And here's a critical question. Since you'll be retiring in September, will you still be available to give talks for garden clubs? I will on birds. <laughs> yes. As long as I can still drive and have my wits about me. Okay. So I should be good for two or three years at least, you know. <laughs> That's good to know. And then once again, I just want to tell everybody out there that there are a lot of critter damage questions and wildlife damage and Drew, Dr. Drew Ricketts will be on um, on November 2nd. Um, for those um, that I was not able to get to, please contact your local um, horticulture agent. Um, pictures of any sort of holes and tracks are, are a great thing um, to send to them. Also, um, if you've got any sort of invasive plants, and any of the insects that are bothering your plants, a good picture and a call to your local horticulture agent um, can help you out with all those questions that we are not able to get to um, at this point. And the Drew Ricketts program, I, I intend to watch that. That's gonna be, he does an awesome job, folks. He is really a wonderful resource. So looking to see if there are any particular, any more questions, particularly to the subject at hand. And I think I've got them. I might, if, if someone send it in a note real quick in the Q&A and I'll get it in. Well, it looks like we typically have more questions than we have time for, but we will be sure to link several articles related to this session on our website. We hope these resources will help answer your questions. Once again, thank you for joining K-State Garden Hour Series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We are so glad you could be here to learn about landscaping for wildlife. We have several interesting sessions coming up in our summer and fall series. Be sure to visit our K-State Garden Hour website to see all the upcoming topics. This session will be recorded and posted in our website by tomorrow afternoon. This webinar ends today. You will receive a prompt to take a evaluation survey. Please fill this out. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at gardenhour at ksu.edu. Thank you again, and we hope to continue uh, for you to tune in on the first Wednesday of each month. Have a great week, everyone.